in a variety of practitioner and management positions, a technology community activist. He supports several information security and technology organizations. Okay. As an example, he's the co-founder of B-Sides. How many of you have heard of B-Sides? Right, developed originally way back to be an alternate to some of these huge conferences that a lot of people were locked out of. He serves on the boards of three security B-Sides nonprofit corporations and helps organize security and B-Sides events. And I'm really, really honored to meet Jack in person. Jack, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. Thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, look, things are on the screen. Uh, first thing, um, this is not me. This is me, and I get to look this way. Also, because of where we are, um, I'm wearing my Gryffindor socks, are you? <laughs> um, I, I love the Wizarding Worlds of Harry Potter. I walk around with my wife, and the children are all like, Mommy, Mommy, it's Dumbledore. Uh, <laughs> I, I suppose it could be worse. They could call me Hagrid. But anyway, um, yeah. We're going to talk about stuff. I hope no one gets value from this presentation. Because what I'm going to talk about is uh, survival skills in InfoSec. And if nobody gets value, that means you're all well adjusted and your life is under control and everybody you work with, their life is under control and everybody's highly productive and always happy. Um, also, I spend a lot of time with technology pieces, and my computers often heckle me in the middle of my presentation. So, uh, yeah, you can expect that. But first, so that, just in case, all of you are happy, healthy, well-adjusted, never stressed, never work with stressed people, I want to share three things with you very quickly. If you work with student groups, um, college hacker clubs, the good guys, not the criminal hackers. There's a project called Pivot Project, um, a lot of labs for helping people understand things like how to do in-map and how to build firewalls and things like that. It's all free. It's a bunch of educators, some folks from SANS, myself and some others uh, are working on making this accessible. So if you're at uh, one of the big technology schools, you don't need this. But if you're at a community school or some place that's struggling to come up with resources, um, it's fairly new, but there's some interesting stuff. So if you work uh, particularly with school groups, that might be of interest to you. Um, this one, if you do software assurance, if you're responsible for testing software, far from perfect, but a lot of people don't know about this. Uh, DHS has funded it, which means you've already paid for it because it's our tax money. It's a big pile of software testing tools. It's also a good way to benchmark whatever you use for software testing. Um, there's a mix of open source and other things there. Uh, the last thing I'll plug is a project of mine called The Shoulders of InfoSec. Uh, one of the things that I discovered is since I tend to hang out with a lot of uh, younger folks at the you know, hacker con scenes, um, I realized that none of us know enough about the history of InfoSec and the people that got us here. And then I come to groups like this and realize that um, None of us do. As soon as you land in InfoSec, whether uh, you're starting your career now or you've been doing it for decades, all you do is run to keep up. So it's just a uh, simple wiki of a lot of the folks that got us where we are now. Not much there. So InfoSec survival skills. Why this topic and why this morning? Um, it keeps coming up. Every now and then we get things, and this is not about you know full tilt burnout. This is about being effective and, and whatever, but the main thing is every time I come to an event like this, and there is a ton of good content throughout the rest of the day, you learn all sorts of stuff and you're psyched. And you go back to work and the burdens of whatever you're dealing with, whether it's just efficiency or frustrations and whether it's work related or not, keep you from actually being able to take the next step. You're going to learn some things, you're going to get some ideas, and you're going to want to act on them, and hopefully this will help you be uh, more efficient or help your team be more efficient or help you understand why some of the people that you work with or work for you um, struggle. And I need to make this clear. Yeah. Um, I love my job. I have a phenomenal job. I work uh, at Tenable Network Security. Uh, I've been there about five years now. Uh, fantastic company. I work with and for brilliant people. Um, we have great customers. Uh, I have a very flexible schedule. Um, I'm on a two-person team with Marcus Ranum. You know, it, it's it's an ideal job. Um, 
And I hope you guys have jobs that you love. Uh, I haven't always. In my dark past, I worked in the auto industry, and every time I think somebody's being a little sleazy with sales techniques, I remember the car business, and then I feel a whole lot better about InfoSec. <laughs> um, but life's more than just work. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into this. And uh, one of the things I'd like to point back to is Dan Gear several years ago made the observation that security is too wide to master, too deep to know, and too fast to photograph. And if Dan feels that way, I'm screwed, right? I mean, let's, let's be honest. If Dan Gear is like, this is overwhelming, it's like, ah, uh, huh. Um, so where does that leave us if we're trying to do a good job? Um, All right, maybe that's a bit harsh. Let's do the, the obligatory cat face palm instead. Uh, but, but how do we cope? You know, how do we cope with these things, um, with the change, the continuous change, the continuously evolving threat landscape, or whatever we want to call it? Not just cope, but, you know, survive and thrive. And the obligatory disclaimer, um, I am not an expert. The last thing I actually considered myself an expert in was uh, Renault automobiles in the early 80s, and uh, they're not in the US anymore, and I'm happy for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm an amateur guide at best. I still occasionally get lost myself, but um, I think I can help folks, and just be aware of that. <laughs> this is one. This is one of those things. Uh, thankfully, um, none of us is getting older. That only happens to our friends, right? Um, and when you add stress, one of the things I've discovered, I mean, I learned this years ago, I've had the same doctor, he like is really good. I've had the same doctor since I was a teenager. Yes, he's really old. Um, so we have a very candid relationship and I, you know, things have happened in life, problems with kids, probably, you know, health problems and other things. And he's like, oh, stress. One of the things you'll notice is your memory is gonna suffer short term. Like, oh, okay. So when I was in my 20s, that was kind of, eh, not really. In my 30s, yeah, I, I see that. Stress level goes up, my ability to remember stuff. Um, now, if my stress level goes up, it's, I travel with piles of paper. We all do. And it's something you don't think about because it's often subtle. But in our industry, how much stuff are you trying to keep rattling around in your head? I mean, we're just trying to keep pointers to all the information. So memory loss is a factor of stress. Um, extreme stress is uh, just stunningly uh, damaging to memory. Um, hopefully none of you experienced that, but if you've uh, had anybody go through that, that's one of them. Um, if we go forward instead of backwards. I threw this slide in this week because uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jessica Barker pose the question about imposter syndrome in InfoSec, and it comes up a lot. Imposter syndrome is the feeling that you're in over your head, people are going to catch on that you really aren't as smart as uh, you pretend to be, um, I'm, I'm a fraud, I really don't belong here, I shouldn't be standing in front of you guys, why are you listening to this crazy old man? Um, and it, a little bit of um, humility is fantastic, but imposter syndrome actually is, it just keeps coming up continuously, and uh, it adds to stress because people worry about whether or not they're good enough to do what they need to do, and that's something to be aware of, and if you've ever had those feelings, there's a lot of resources out there, and basically it's okay to realize you're over your head, we all are, um, and not let it get to you because that just compounds things. And. Uh, and then there are those people who um, think they're way smarter than they are, and we certainly have those in InfoSec too. The Dunning-Kruger effect is what that's called, as, as my computer has reminded me. Uh, but as we dive in, I wanted to share three words that are, that are critical in, in stress, burnout, mental, mental health assessment. Um, the three words are efficacy. This is personal efficacy doesn't mean that we're winning the war against the criminals. It means, do you feel like you're doing a good job? Um, if yes, that's cool. You're probably under less stress because you're content with things. There are two negatives that we, we look at in this space, and they are um, exhaustion, physical and mental, and then the other one is cynicism. And cynicism is a little bit tricky. We'll talk about that in a minute. But exhaustion is tricky. And these play together because if you are working hard, and getting results for it and feel like it's good and you're satisfied with what you and your team are doing, you have that good exhaustion, right? And you feel connected to what you're doing, it's great. 
And what happens sometimes is you will have a crisis. I've seen it with people where they get a major breach or incident at work and it, they question everything they've done and now they don't feel effective anymore and suddenly that goes from good exhaustion to complete collapse. Uh, and they, they spiral into burnout. Uh, the other one is cynicism, and this is really tricky because as information security people, we need to be skeptical, right? We need to be skeptical because people tell us lies all the time. Um, whole other conversation, we make them lie to us because of some of the stuff we do to secure our environments without thinking about people just trying to do their jobs, but that's a different story. But it's easy to fall over from a healthy skepticism into outright cynicism, and I love this George Carlin quote, it gets thrown at me with some regularity, because um, I am fairly cynical, but um, you know, there's, there's an idealism. You have to give, you have to give a crap to be disappointed, right? And so there's one of the things that people miss about cynicism. But if it gets too far, it's, um, it's problematic. Uh, so some years ago, a group of us did a study on burnout in InfoSec. And a couple of friends of mine have done studies of burnout in, um, in InfoSec and also in the hacker community. Uh, I've got a couple of friends who are actually working towards uh, degrees in psychology. Posi one is the career shift out of uh, her prior career. Um, one of the cool things was over half the people that we did in our, our survey um, had no indicators for anything. They were just happy people. They were well balanced and controlled and so I thought I'm going to dig that data up and let's look at that data and look for patterns that help us understand what they're, how these people function. And this is what I found. Nothing. Um, <clears throat> Happy bastards had no patterns. Uh, so, moving on. It's morning. Who wants coffee? I'm, I'm good at I like to tell myself I'm good at metaphors and stories. So the poor coffee bean. It's out there in idyllic tropical uh, conditions and growing and happy and somebody plucks it off of the shrub and packs it into giant boxes and ships it across the ocean and roasts it and then grinds it and then adds hot water often under extreme pressure. <laughs> this is a metaphor for InfoSec or what? That's, that's part of my morning shrine. Um, and uh, the, out, the outcome, you know, here's a shot of espresso and that outcome depends on, you know, were the beans picked in the right condition, are they the right beans, were they shipped well, were they handled well in shipping, were they roasted properly, did you have the temperature and pressure and all of those things right, and then depending on your personal tastes, you add sweeteners or you add more water or you add uh, creamers or flavorings and other things to make this product of this whole process something that makes you happy in the morning or whenever you, um, you indulge. And if we take that to this idea of stress and trying to manage our own stress and productivity, um, there's, there's too much stuff here, but I want to talk through it a little bit. So I kind of think of this as, as the coffee machine of, of life. And the coffee machine of life starts out with some burdens that we put on. And work is both a burden and a joy. Um, family responsibilities, families, you know, one of the things that's, um, that's common with a lot of uh, mature professionals in this industry is we have gone from having young kids that we had to deal with to now you've got older kids and you may be dealing with your parents and so you're a caregiver in two directions at once and that's fantastic, right? Families are wonderful, but there can be some serious burdens there. Um, and personal and social obligations. Uh, and you know, there's, there's some tricks there. Now all of those can help you out. How much autonomy you have, we'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, and just your personality and coping skills. I mean, there are people I know that you just can't make them not happy. It's like, I hate them. I mean, I, I love them, but I, it's, dude, really. Um, <clears throat> So what I did was I decided to do something highly scientific. Um, I asked a lot of folks on Twitter um, to give me their feedback. <clears throat> and I got hundreds of responses, uh, publicly on Twitter, privately on Twitter, text messages, emails, phone calls. Hundreds of people responded uh, with thoughtful answers. And um, 
some more thoughtful than others, some more in-depth than others, but there was a lot of great stuff. And that's uh, what I want to spend a few minutes talking about, is where, where we are. So I do have to call out one response that came in almost instantly. <clears throat> and yes, my wife was not pleased with that one until she tried it and decided it was okay. Um, at least for her to do it. Something I hadn't realized until doing this and having these conversations was that gross, again, pop psychology, but there seem to be, generally speaking, big stress things and little stress things. And the way people deal with them needs to align with that. And like in InfoSec, context is key. Now, some of you may know that I was born and raised in Texas. Um, and I get back with some regularity, usually to Austin, to see friends in the Austin and San Antonio area. Um, so here we have a redneck pickup truck, <clears throat> rust, cherry picker in the bed, the ever popular pro-secession uh, bumper sticker on it. <clears throat> and that kind of sends you a message. But if we take a closer look and realize that truck has a Massachusetts plate, the context changes and the message changes. And in this case, the message is this. You need to know the context for your problems. Can you solve them? Um, what I'm trying to say is some problems require that you take a leap and some of them require you just back, step back slowly. Don't get it wrong. Um, don't leap there. Changing jobs every 9 to 15 months because you can't handle the small stressors in day-to-day -day life is really bad. It maintains a high stress level for you, it lowers your productivity, and you're solving the wrong problem. Conversely, if you're in a hopeless situation and you apply all of the little bandages um, just to make it livable, you're, you're just prolonging your suffering. And I'm talking about stress here and uh, productivity, not InfoSec, because InfoSec is nothing like putting lots of little bandages on things without solving underlying problems, right? That's a whole other depressing talk, but <clears throat> we have the same issues. So common answers. Um, yeah, it's from Twitter, must be right. But they actually, they were pretty heartfelt. Um, so I asked the question, how do you cope? A lot of people answered with badly, not well, um, poorly, cry, rant. These are not necessarily ideal. Um, you know, maybe a little ranting is good. I'm, I'm a pro-rant person in the right context. Uh, but the, the number one thing um, I've distilled down to this is do something, some sort of physical activity. For some people, it is get up, walk around the building, and come back. For other people, it's being a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's, you know, martial arts, it's running, it's kayaking, it is some form of, it is golf, it is whatever. And a very large number of them said outdoors too. You know, they run, hike, you know, just leave a building. And it's amazing that uh, probably about a hundred folks had some form of exercise, low impact to extremely high impact. It is something that a lot of people find valuable. And um, I should try it. <clears throat> I do walk, you know, I, I, do th I do little things. Little things make a difference, I've discovered. Like, uh, you park at the other end of the parking lot, not when it's, you know, uh, universal city size parking lot, but you know, you walk, you walk the extra 15 car spaces into the grocery store to grab something, you just get a little bit of adrenaline going, you just, a little bit of activity, a little bit more activity. Getting outdoors helps a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> single most common answer, although it's really second to um, something coming up soon, and we will attempt some, um, Let's see if we can get some noise to come out of here. So, music. Whether you like mellow music, little seals and crocs, uh, someone agrees, my wife loves it.
a pro a pro drinking strychnine song. Uh, that's punk, the decade plus before punk, and grunge decades before grunge. The Sonics are amazing, um, but that was one of the probably the, the third giant bucket of responses was music, listening to music, creating music, playing music, playing with music, um, whatever type of music it is. Um, people really get a lot out of music. And, uh, you know, we know this, but it's, if you work music into your world, um, you know, and it's getting easier, you know, the music collection, but the streaming music stations, of course, they're all imperfect. The other night I was like uh, somewhere, I was like, oh, I need to sleep, and I hit Pandora, and it's like, hey, there's a class, no, it wasn't Pandora. Anyway, one of them, <clears throat> and I, they had the classical relaxation channel and I put it on and so we got all sorts of mellow soft classical music and somebody's algorithm is screwed up because about three in the morning uh, fly to the bumblebee cranked in I was like that's not mellow now I'm never going back to sleep but anyway <clears throat> putting music into into your uh, routine somewhere um, you know one of the things I used to do is listen to podcasts continuously now I like make sure I throw some music in um, when I travel, I listen to a lot of music of different kinds just to get out of that. It makes, um, if you fly a lot, you probably know that we all walk around with earbuds in because flying is such a joy these days. I'm just going to get into our little place, get into a happy place or less miserable. Um, <clears throat> which leads us to... Yeah, the Ramones said it. Alcohol is probably the single uh, most common response. So many people said, I assume you're going to put that there that I'm not adding it. Um, in fairness, most of us feel that it's not healthy that we drink the amount that we do. Uh, but there is a stunning amount of alcohol consumption. And uh, I was conceived and born under Dwight David Eisenhower, so you know what time I grew up, so I have no moral judgments about the recreational use of pharmaceuticals or anything, as long as you don't screw up anybody else's life or make yours too bad. But, um, you know, this is a really common one. Um, fair number of drugs answers. A handful of people uh, were very specific about the choices of where they lived because of the availability of uh, recreational marijuana. Um, and especially particularly people with health issues. That's, you know, your world. This is one that a lot of people rely on. The alcohol is not great, the drugs, um, some of the drugs are completely legal. A handful of people, uh, fewer than I expected, are on SSRIs or other um, mild um, anti, not really antipsychotic at that level, but just a little not even full tilt antidepressants, some antidepressants, but you know, um, <clears throat> that's it. I don't have to, do, we're all adults, you know. No. Friends and family. This um, is where mutual support is really awesome. The whole stress and burnout project, the burnout research we did started because there were a couple of us that were going through some stuff and we would check in on each other. And then we would say, hey, did you see so-and-so at the RSA? They looked a little beat. It's like, oh yeah, the, the, the marriage is in trouble. I'm like, ah, all right, let's, let's you know, round the troops and make sure they feel you know, that they're part of the community. And it just kept growing from there. And mutual support rocks. There's a handful of folks that, that you know, we check on each other regularly. It's one of the beautiful things to come back to Richard's opening comments about connecting with your local community. They're people that understand uh, your struggles. And, um, you know, the, the challenge is if it's one-sided. If you're giving support, there's some, you feel good about that, and eventually it becomes a burden. But friends and family, you just have to understand what your role is. As I said, you know, you, you see the, I don't know if the billboards are here, but I've seen them all up and down the East Coast about uh, roles changing, and it uh, starts out as, uh, you know, a kid with the middle-aged parents, and then it's the adult child with the, with the senior parents, and, you know, roles change, and you need to understand where you fit in there to be able to get value out of it. One that is, um, 
fairly high up on the list of things that people talked about is some level of bi disconnecting or unplugging, whether it's just disconnecting from work or whether it's disconnecting from technology altogether. And this, there have been studies that prove this, you know, email kills us, you know, email destroys our brains, you all know that, and we're, we're all slaves to the little pop-up in the corner, you, 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 stop it, stop it. Um, and so if you can get some management around there and, and disconnecting. I was on a cruise this year instead of going to RSA. It was awesome. I think once a decade you should be given a pass. And um, I spent, you know, four days fully disconnected. Um, the price of internet connectivity on a cruise ship kind of helped that, but it was, you know, it was cool. And there you have to deal, you come up with your own ways of coping with that. Um, because if you actually disconnect, you come back in and you look at your phone or you open the laptop and you're like, eh. uh, a bunch of other things that are worth mentioning. There were a bunch of folks found various mindfulness or meditation routines very helpful for them. Um, professional therapy, a handful of folks uh, highly recommend that. Um, the productivity tools, the getting things done and other tools like that, if, if, you, if those tools help you be effective, they help you reduce stress. They help you do your job. They help you maintain balance. Uh, a lot of people, they're pets, you know. Um, a handful of people said either Imager or Reddit, go to the uh, slash A-W-W awe and go look at kittens and puppies for a while. So it's very therapeutic. I can see that. Uh, a variety of hobbies from like the hobbies I don't have time for, blacksmithing, wood carving, sailing, things like that. Uh, a lot of video games, which is an interesting challenge because if you sit in front of computers all day and then you decompress by sitting in front of computers all night, <clears throat> I don't know uh, if, it, if it works. Uh, I did get some edge cases. Um, I don't recommend these necessarily. Carving cameo images of dead emperors in the cream of Oreo cookies. Um, a couple of folks suggested nihilism. That may be a bit much. Um, I will not out them, but it was an Australian uh, person who said covering yourself in peanut butter and howling at the moon. Um, <clears throat> redneck golf, uh, the choice of caliber there tells you their military and government role. 556 at 500 yards. And this makes the sex, drugs, and death metal look like the normal one. Uh, something else that's worth mentioning is a handful of folks said, don't let it bug you. It's just a job. It's only software. It's just security. Don't let it bug you. And there were two classes of folks there, two main groups. One were those just happy people, right? Bastards. Um, the others were folks that had had something happen in life, probably uh, not... Uh, probably late 30s or older, because when you're young you forget these lessons, that has made them say, <laughs> it, it's just a job. Um, hopefully you don't have those, because that's the, you know, losing family members, cancer battles, divorce. Big, huge, ugly things happen that put stuff in perspective. It's very effective. I hope none of you face that. Um, it's very effective. It doesn't work when you're young. The older you get, you're like, wait, this is stupid. Um, so I hope, but you will find that a lot of people have that attitude, and it is, uh, it's life-changing. And, uh, but it's, it's not, you know, it's not the one I recommend. Don't, don't lose loved ones to cancer. Uh, don't, don't have cancer battles if you can avoid it. It's, it's bad. Uh, <clears throat> so some general common sense advice. Don't face challenges alone. When you're a kid, you, at the, Camp, you can't go into the pool alone. If you're in the military and you're in an action, you don't go into action alone. Um, but in InfoSec, we all work alone even when we work in teams. Uh, that's problematic. Uh, don't make employees face challenges alone. Um, I have a bit of counterintuitive advice that just keeps coming back and back, and it's do more. Uh, take on more work. The key is it's work that you want to do, work that is satisfying and rewarding. And I'll plug this, because I'm I am a serial volunteer. You know, I've besides the various boards I've been on in InfoSec, I've served on the board of the uh, Blacksmith Guild in the Northeast. I've volunteered as a shipwright and uh, volunteered as uh, 
sail crew on a square rigger. Um, I've done all sorts of crazy stuff and it's rewarding and therefore you feel better when you go back to whatever it isn't. Um, volunteer, mentor, speak. Um, again, let's reinforce Richard's point, but wherever, but you know, hey, hey, you've got unique perspectives on things that you could share here next year at an ISSA LA monthly meeting, at a user group, at your church, at your synagogue, at your kid's school. Uh, there are places where what you know uh, could be shared and you will feel good because people say things that they don't always remember to say at work. Like, wow, thank you. Cool, hey, I like that. Uh, share what you know. Mentoring is good. You don't have to be that expert to mentor somebody. And one of the great things about mentoring is, man, you see what a hypocrite you are. Yep. Oh man, that's that's a terrible situation. But what you need to do is this. Don't fall for this trick. You got to do this, otherwise you end up like this, right? Okay. Hey. All right. All right. Don't don't let it don't let it keep you up at night. Talk to you next week. Um, <laughs> and then you look at your own situation and like, uh, and that's good because we sometimes need that, and especially if we bring our you know those realizations on ourselves. Uh, learn something new, but education is work. Um, so it's got to be satisfying. So maybe it moves your career forward. Maybe it's something you just want to do. You know, maybe you're playing with drones. Maybe you are, you know, pushing the bounds with Raspberry Pis because you now have a policy job and don't play with hardware. Um, who knows what it is? Find something that entertains you. Maybe it moves your career forward. Um, let's ask a stupid question. Who has too many well-qualified uh, employees on their team? Is it easy finding them? <laughs> <clears throat> oh god, too many words, too many words. Uh, Michael Leiter and um, uh, Susan Maslock did this, the foundational work in, in the psychological field on uh, stress and burnout. They've done some great work. Uh, one of the papers that Leiter wrote uh, in 91 had a few choice things that I'll break out piece by piece. And whether you're the employee or whether you're the manager or whether you're the executive, these are uh, probably more true today than they were in 91 based on the research they had been doing for decades at that time. Capacity to influence organization policies reduces susceptibility to burnout. Wait, we have to listen to the employees? We're an infosec. We're not at in and out or McDonald's, you know, there, there needs to be some communications. Organizational settings that undermine autonomy reduce the employee's potential and increase tendency to become cynical and distant. Organizational environments that provide staff members with a sense of control enhance engagement with work. Um, you know how you torture the uh, deposed dictator of a country you've overthrown while you have them in, imprisoned? in a suite on the top floor of a luxury hotel in some city per Geneva Convention. Gourmet food, all the comforts. Lights out is never the exact same time every night. Food does not come on a regular schedule. The four hours of television you allow them are never the same four hours during the course of the day great life. They have no structure to their life and no control over it and no insight into it. Takes a while, but um, doesn't take as long as you think. If you've got no control over your world and somebody makes it clear that you've got no control over your world, it, it gets there. Now, of course, the rest of that trick is that um, you have regular interrogators and you play all the interrogation games and do it politely, and the actual interrogators are the people that bring the food and make the bed and just you know chat politely while they're in there and then they spill. But um, taking away a sense of control is, it's, it, it'll get to you. Um, it doesn't require waterboarding or anything else. Uh, it takes some investment, uh, but that's something. Anyway, uh, provide feedback constantly. One of the things that we've found is that a lot of times we don't have a... I can't let you do what you want to do. We've got, we got stuff to do. 
But I'll tell you what, this is why we're doing what we have to do. And I know it doesn't really make sense, but you see this, we're in this point in the company where we've taken a fourth venture capital round, we've got to do this, we've got to, the IPO has to happen. We have to look at these things from the way Wall Street does. No, that's not logical. But here's what the, the logic is. Like, oh, okay, I get it. So, so maybe those stock options aren't worthless, right? Well, that's our hope. Okay, you know, we, whatever it is, explain what's going on. Manage workloads, workload distribution. This is one that I love to see people that are continuously fried, particularly in uh, incident response. The DFIR crews, um, there just aren't enough of them. And so they work them until they burn out, and then uh, there are even fewer of them. And DFIR, years ago it was uh, PCI uh, QSAs that we always ran into in the burnout cycle. It's uh, DFIR now is more likely to be a, a, a slice. And if you push them too hard, you lose them, and then you as the manager have to do it yourself. Um, that doesn't help you. Um, allow them to disconnect, maybe force it. Uh, Volkswagen has done some dumb stuff lately. That's being really kind, calling it dumb instead of criminal and evil. Um, but one of the things they did years ago is they started disconnecting access to uh, their mail system, email system. So a lot of people couldn't actually connect and check their mail uh, outside of work hours. What a crazy idea. It's all right, come in. You know, it's, it's, you have access from you know, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. maybe, so, uh, but uh, you know, cut that out, uh, disconnect. Offer education. I'm sure most of you have heard the, the joke about the two executives talking to each other. It's like, we gotta, we got a budget for education. we got to send our people to school. we got to get people trained. It's like, what if we spend money on training and they leave? What if we don't and they stay? <laughs> um, road warriors. Was the, the commercial, you know, some people have to travel for work and some get to. Um, travel for work is not the same as travel for fun, but you can make it better. You know, if you get out of, um, get out of your hotel, packing better. I'm not going to give you packing advice. Everybody's got, I've changed through the years. Everybody's got their own things, but think about how efficiently you pack. Think about um, how many days it is you're in a hotel before you move in, right? If you're here, one night or two nights, do you unpack the bags and move in? No. If you're settling in for a week or ten days, or three or four days, wherever that line is, don't live out of a suitcase. Act like a human if they've got drawers and, you know, use the closets and drawers and, and like, settle in and make it feel like your bedroom. Um, or live out of whatever it is that works for you. Um, we tend to eat road food uh, and eat and drink too much. Um, you know, maybe try to eat better, not more. Um, if you can get out, now this is one that I get. So I'm a tall, um, I, I'm, I'm not a small person. I am a white dude with a giant beard, so people uh, are intimidated by that often. So places that I can wander around are different than others. This is yet another place that life is unfair to women, because me hanging out alone at a bar, um, at a dive bar, uh, to get some work done is, is different. But um, if you can find some place to get out, even if you take your laptop and park it there, get a little more creative than Starbucks. Um, it does require knowing your environment. And it's not always this obvious that you're in a bad neighborhood, but if you do step out of the hotel and see a crow carrying a knife with an ankle bracelet on, you are in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, this, thing's, this thing is breaking parole, breaking probation. He's obviously out of the house with that ankle bracelet. Um, it's like, yep, I'm going back in. I'm moving furniture against the door of my room. Um, but ask around. You know, and it depends on your personality. I do, again, big old dude, I, I ask what's safe and what's not, and I use bars as co-working spaces um, often uh, during the day because they're quiet and uh, they're not overcrowded and you don't drink to, you don't actually have to drink booze in bars. Um, uh, but, you know, you, you find a place, find what's good, find, you know, Decent food outside of the chains. You know, there's the, there's better food than Applebee's. There's you know, um, one of the tricks that I use, by the way, is I will sometimes, if I'm in a tourist city, uh, grab a cop on the street and say, "Hey, uh, officer, my goal is to have a good evening, 
and not become paperwork for you or anybody else on the force. And they're like, you have my attention. It's like, so how far can I wander here before, you know, other places? Like in New Orleans, you can wander all over the quarter relatively safely, except for some alleys. But then New Orleans, you cross a couple of streets and the world changes. Most cities are that way. Ask somebody. Um, and like I said, it, I have great uh, luck with that with, with, um, with law enforcement. It's like, I don't want to be paperwork for you. How do I avoid that? Um, they appreciate that. Water. We don't hydrate enough. Airplanes dry us out. Coffee dries us out. Coffee uh, dries us out. Alcohol dries us out. We don't drink enough water. Um, you just hydrate. I, not a commercial for them, but there's a product called Noon, N-U-U-N. It's usually really healthy people and high-functioning alcoholics that love this stuff. They're like Alka-Seltzer tabs, only with electrolytes. There are other brands, but the cool thing is they will make that swamp water that comes out of the tap in your hotel less swampy, uh, and it's got a little electrolyte, some, you know, some potassium and things in there that, that, that'll that help, makes that palatable. Um, whatever you do, uh, you know, if you buy bottled water and do that, whatever, just more water. Um, One of the things I've learned is, as I said in the beginning, I'm not a professional. I'm not an expert. So I try to be careful when I'm giving advice, this sort of big generalized stuff. Um, you are not a professional. Uh, don't act like it. But you can be a friend, a mentor, a peer, when people need help. But one thing I want to remind you is like they tell you when you fly, you have to put on your own mask before you can help others. If you're... Um, if you're stressed, if you're uh, not in a good place, you're probably not going to be very good at helping. And one of the things that we've discovered is uh, just listening is a huge value for a lot of people. And with that, I want to um, wind us down with a little more music. Um, back to the context idea. It's not always obvious to us what matters in life. Um, Two guitarists that um, I uh, idolize, um, Dick Dale and the late B.B. King. Um, the Gibson and Fender have commemorative guitars based on their preferences. And um, the Dick Dale Strat is an interesting one. The, the actual beast is a different uh, animal, though. So in the late 50s, Dick Dale moved from uh, the Boston area out here. And he started, um, he and Link Ray and some others really pioneered surf music. And one of the things that Dick Dale did was he went to Leo Fender and said, hey, I don't have any money, but I need a guitar and an amp and all the stuff I have just doesn't work. Because I go to these shows and things don't sound right and they break. So they became friends, the broke kid from New England and Leo Fender. And over the years, um, Leo decided he needed a custom Strat. And so he built, Leo Fender hand built, hand assembled a Stratocaster for Dick Dale, which he then played backwards because he's left handed and didn't know. That's why the, the neck is the way it is. If any of your guitarists are, are over, you'll note that the uh, machine heads are backwards. That neck is actually backwards. And the uh, thinner, the higher note strings are shorter. They're like four inches, three and a half inches shorter than they would be on a normal guitar, which means they can take the abuse of a percussive player like Dick Dale. Um, it also changes the way strumming sounds. Um, that guitar was tuned for him by Leo Fender, and it is the same guitar that he plays when he tours today. He's currently on a southeastern U.S. tour. He's in his 70s. He says he's in his third battle with cancer um, and still puts on an amazing show. He doesn't have the stamina he used to. He doesn't play the, the trumpet anymore. Um, doesn't have the wind for it. But uh, the amps he travels with, Leo Fender hand-built his showman amps for him and tuned them for him. If he doesn't have his guitar... Um, 
He's not really Dick Dale. You know, he can pick up an axe and tune it, but this thing's got 50 years under its belt with him. Um, and that seems like you know, a pretty straightforward thing to say about, uh, about a guitarist and their guitar. We lost uh, BB just over a year ago. Um, but every, most, most people know that his guitar was named Lucille. What most people don't know is that um, in the winter of 1949, BB King played a dance hall in Twist, Arkansas. Um, there was a plywood, and it was a stick and plywood building. Um, open, just a big open room. The way they heated those dance halls was to put a 55 gallon steel drum of kerosene in the middle of the room, half filled it with kerosene and lit it. That was the uh, heat. Um, during the show, the barrel got knocked over. So now 20 or so gallons of burning kerosene are on the wooden floor of this dance hall. The band runs out, BB realizes he's left his guitar in there. He had just paid $35 for that guitar. Ran back in, grabbed it, got in the car, and the band went on to the next town. The next night, they hear about what happened. People had died in that fire. People had died in a fire. And I found out what had happened was it was two men were fighting over a woman named Lucille. And he named his guitar Lucille to remind him never to do anything that stupid again in his life. He needed a guitar, but not that guitar. And once he adopted this, the ES-355, which is a stereo guitar, he's one of the few musicians that, uh, has, that adopted those, um, there's a reason when you go to hard rock cafes and places like that around the world, you'll find a genuine Lucille. Because he's one of the greatest guitarists in history, but to him, he needed a Lucille, not the Lucille. And we make that mistake of not understanding what's critical to us and looking at the obvious, and maybe what's obvious isn't the right answer. You know, sometimes it takes um, nearly, uh, nearly dying in a fire. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> context, perspective, there's a ton of good stuff coming up. That's my talk, and I want to stress that is not the end. This is the beginning of a fantastic day of content and conversation, and I uh, thank you all for um, joining me this morning for my little... Uh, non-technical chat about effectiveness and survival and being effective. Hopefully uh, nobody got anything out of it, but if you did, um, that's cool too. And uh, I'll be around all day. Thank you very much.